G'day everyone, Matt Ellis with you for the latest edition of the Cricket Library Podcast. It's wonderful to have your company and I'm sure you'll enjoy our guest today, Graham Manu. He was once doing a marine biology degree. I don't know if it was divine intervention or the kinship of all living things, but I tell you, Jerry, at that moment, I was a marine biologist. (laughs) He went on to become Baggy Green number 411 and he also... Hit the ING Cup sign, not once, but twice. He's hitting him well. Oh, Hang on it. There it is, 50 grand. And it's a very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast to Graham Manu. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. How are you? Yeah, doing really well. It's uh, great to have another member of the Baggy Green Club join us and everyone who puts on the baggy green has a passion for cricket that starts somewhere can you give us a little bit of an insight into where the fire was lit for graham manu yeah um i I think i'm pretty a bit of a common tale to be honest with you matt um you know with an older brother um and in growing up in the 80s you know i spent a fair bit of time um in the backyard or, or up driveways or, well, fortunately for us, you know, we, uh, we could play in the, the middle of the street in our suburbs. So I guess that's where the fire was lit. And, um, ironically, we, uh, we live next door to our grandparents and, um, my uncle was, uh, was not a bad cricketer himself. He played a, a few second living games for South Australia. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we shared that passion and, yeah, we had quite a number of kids in the street that, um, yeah, some serious test matches were played. So yeah, that's where it really started for me. No, nothing like a good serious test match. I remember <laughs> playing Christmas days with my cousins and some of the more competitive games of cricket I've ever played actually in the backyard. And it seems to be a common thread uh, for a lot of a lot of cricketers. They develop their game playing in that fun environment of the backyard. What was your uh, first ex- experience or first memories, I guess, of, of taking that uh, playing cricket for fun and then moving into a more serious environment? Yeah, first memories um, were probably the back end of, um, of primary school. Um, again, um, you know, having having a brother that was two years older than I, and um, not a lot of uh, not a lot of uh, I guess organised sport for. For my age group, I was, I was um, you know, looking for something to do, and um, you know, my brother's uh, age group was was able to play um, cricket on a Saturday. It was a twenty five over a side competition, even back then. So um, that was when it went from the backyard to, to playing more seriously. And um, ironically, it was around the same sort of time that um, I fell into to wicket keeping. Yeah, uh, my um, my first passion, um, deep passion, was was probably soccer. Um, so the other uncle that lived next door played um, played soccer for for West Adelaide and then Heidelberg in what was the old NSL. Um, wow! So uh, yeah, we, um, we we used to love love soccer in the winter and um, and cricket in the summer. But um, yeah, having that sort of soccer background, you're always in the action and. Being the young kid, you got pushed into. Um, well, no one else wanted to to be the wicketkeeper, so it was a way for me to to get a game, and I, I just loved every minute of it because you were in the action, and um, yeah, from there I, I I didn't stop loving it. Yeah, having your hands on the ball, getting getting into the action of the game, every ball of the game, there's a chance of something happening as a wicketkeeper. Now you. Um I understand you you did some study uh, as a in marine biology. Can you can, can you <laughs> give us a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's got a real <laughs> Seinfeld. Yeah, that Seinfeld feel yeah. to it, doesn't it? So yeah, was that happening while you were trying to make a name for yourself as a cricketer? Were the, the two coexisting there for a while? Yeah, they were, um, and um, un- unfortunately. Um, you know, when back back then, um, back in the dark ages, um, uh, universities were were less inclined to be, um, uh, I guess, more catering to 
to professional sports people and particularly um, some of the subjects that uh, that you had to undertake in the first and second year um, some of the some of the subjects weren't um, on site and um, probably the the sticking point for me was um, was when the oceanographers group um, wouldn't allow me to sit exams um, in Hobart um, in and around the shield match um, wow. that was when I thought this was going to be a real challenge, and then the the second challenge for me um, uh, with what I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to dive um, um, with some of the research and, and and I guess just my general passion for 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 marine life. And um, I was born with a hole in my heart, and uh, one of the one of the criteria before you went and um, secured your diving license was to get um, ill clear from the doctor and. I went and saw the SACA doctor at the time and um, said, look, I'm, I'm, I'd like to undertake um, uh, getting my diving license. He said, no problems. And just as he was about to sign off, I said, oh, what about my hole in my heart? And he said, ah, thanks for, thanks for refreshing my mind. And um, oh, wow. essentially I couldn't, I couldn't go ahead and do that because um, – uh, you know, should should there be complications with the uh, the oxygen tank um, where the hole in my heart exists, um, it wouldn't cope um, with the shunt. Um, so you know, if if you were down under the water, it'd be within thirty seconds. You probably wouldn't see um, another another minute of life. So wow. um, yeah, it, it was unfortunate, but um, I guess. That then um, allowed me to turn my attention to to another passion down the track, which um, which was uh, to use that um, I guess that that setback to help help with other people that had suffered um, you know or were born with um, heart disease. So um, you know, sort of out of the bad situation, personally came a, a a productive one in that you know down the track I was able to raise money for for kids require that required um, life saving heart surgery. So, and is that it was a good that uh, came from it. Is that something that you're still involved with? Yeah, not as not as um, not as much as I would like to be. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of my involvement um, initially started with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in in South Australia, and then. Um, I moved into an organisation called Heart Kids, um, the SA branch, um, and we. Uh, I was an ambassador there, and we did some did some good work with those guys um, while I was playing. But um, then moving moving into state, and and I guess their business model has has changed as well. So um, I uh, I haven't done as much as I would like. Um, I still keep in contact with um, with Chris McDermott, the old or uh, well, the inaugural Adelaide um, Crows captain. He's um, he's got his foundation that's been doing magnificent work in South Australia for many years, and um, every so often I'll, I'll keep in touch with him. But uh, I was only talking to someone the other day about um, you know, this, this period of time. You know, I'm sure has been an opportunity for so many to reflect and and prioritize the other things that perhaps they've let slip and and that's certainly one of those passions that I've had for a long time that I for various reasons I've let slip so it's um it's on my radar to to re-engage with that stuff yeah yeah excellent and just back on the on the cricket the entry into first class cricket you made your debut in a fairly obscure location in Zim- in Zimbabwe playing for the mm. Cricket Academy. And just looking through the, that list of cricketers over there, Bradley Hodge, your captain, and yeah. a young fast bowler who we get to see play test cricket later that year, um, Brett Lee, 17 wickets mm. at 5.35 on that tour. What was it like getting a, an early taste of someone who would go on to be – one of the best in the business. Oh, I was um, a, a tour itself. It was brilliant. Um, you know, Zimbabwe were, had just come back into to international cricket, and it was just prior to them um, participating in the '99 World Cup. Actually, so um, we had the opportunity to play their World Cup squad um, in three one-day games at Harare, which was fantastic. But um, 
yeah, we had uh, Brad Hodge, as you mentioned. Corey Richards was uh, another yeah. name that was um, on that tour touted um, as uh, a, another potential test cricketer. Actually, Nocky came as well um, with similar raps. But, um, yeah, Brett Lee was there and um, so he was he was uh, terrific on and off the field. Um, but uh, I actually... I actually felt sorry for for the the poor lads that we had to play um, yeah. in Zimbabwe because they just weren't equipped um, at that time to face someone um, not only at that pace but um, of his skill as well. And um, I, I recall a, a young guy; he actually um, got hit in the in the helmet or just below the helmet, right oh, behind gee. the ear. And um, yeah, I remember going up. Um, to him at the stumps and you know blood was sort of coming out of his ear and, and we just it almost killed the game um, as such and um, you know it, it wasn't nice and I remember at the end of the tour Rod, Rod Marsh asked us all to provide um, you know the, the local association with all our cricket equipment because um, not only is it the right thing to do, but they were they were certainly struggling. So it was um, yeah, mixed emotions in some ways when you see someone like that um, with immense talent um, playing against a, a, a group of guys that just weren't capable. Um, it, it put a bit of a dampener. But then when we when we were able to play against um, the national team, um, you just uh, you got a glimpse of of what he was about, and um, you know certainly no surprise. That he went on to achieve all he did in the game because uh, he was a special talent and and was was that um, since day one. As soon as everyone saw him come into the game at at the age of fifteen. Yeah, absolutely. And you, your experience there preparing you to eventually make your way into the South Australian team as a regular member. What what are your early recollections of playing regular first class cricket in in Australia? No. Mm, um, I remember it was um, it was pretty brutal. Um, you know, back early early on, you know, um, uh, as a young kid coming in, they they certainly didn't make things comfortable for you, and um, and you know, it was a, a significant um, step up from from club cricket. And and to be to be brutally honest, I, I don't think I was um, I was prepared for um, for my debut for South Australia and, and the first year or two, it, um, it was really learning on the job. Um, I was, uh, I was a young kid and Greg Chappell was, um, was, uh, the coach and, and Tim Nielsen had just stepped aside to, to take on a coaching, um, role with South Australia as well. And so they gave me an opportunity that perhaps, um, you know, I probably wasn't ready for, um, uh, from a batting point of view and perhaps mentally, um, I was still quite young in terms of um, my cricket experience. So it, it was a real challenge early on, but I think um, that held me in pretty good stead um, over my career because it, it, it certainly made me a hell of a lot more resilient. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the wickets back then were, were certainly um, things that I'd never seen before. You know, on Adelaide Oval Day 2, you, you'd have big, big chunks of, um, of turf coming out and um, to, and then to get the opportunity to keep on that on day four where, uh, you know, I hadn't seen it before, but um, it, uh, yeah, it was tough. But um, looking back, I wouldn't have it any other way now, to be honest with you, because um, as I said, I think it, it held me in good stead and to be surrounded by some guys that, that were in and out of the Australian team in Darren Lehman and, and Greg Blewett and Jason Gillespie and, you know, Paul Wilson, um, and then to play against the likes of, of Elliot Rifle and Barry in my first game was, was a real thrill. Yeah, absolutely. A, a really strong era of Australian domestic cricket uh, back then. And uh, one, of, one of the things I loved about Australian domestic cricket uh, was the Mercantile Mutual Cup, the ING Cup. And mm-hmm. uh, I'd, I'd love to ask you about something special that you've done that I think you're the only person that's actually done this twice in the history of, of the competitions. Uh, for those that are listening that aren't aware, the primary sponsor of the competition had some signs placed around the ground 
with a cash bounty for players who could hit the sign on the full. Stephen Waugh was, I think, the first person to do it and, and the cash bounty was something like $140,000. There were other players that hit it as well. But you became the fifth person to hit the sign and the first person to hit it straight down the ground, I think, and at the Adelaide Oval when you're thinking – the boundary sizes and the dimensions of the ground there, you picked probably the longest part of the ground to hit. Uh, can you talk us through uh, the, the experience of uh, doing doing something like that and and just the whole, uh, like the the highlights of it, the, the, the yeah. cameras pan to the, the change room and everyone's up and about and everyone's loving life. Can you, can you talk <laughs> us through that one, and then and then I'll ask you about the second one because the second one yeah. is, is a lesser known story. Yeah, um, you're right. Probably the longest boundary in uh, in world cricket, and back in those days, the bats weren't what they were now, are they? So take some take some strength to hit there. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, look, it was uh, <laughs> it was um, it was one of those things, mate. That um, yeah, it was it was a great concept and. Everyone um, spoke about it, and um, you know, heading into the season, we we had team rules about um, you know who if someone hit the sign, what would happen. So we'd we'd agreed on um, those that were were playing in the in the game or in the squad of that game would get um, half of the takings, and the, and the player uh, that hit would have the the remaining half, but. Um, what we didn't know um, early on was that the tax man would have his his share of it too. <laughs> so we ended up with not much, but that uh, was all right. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, look, it was it was a strange old game actually, and um, my recollection is that I think the now Australian coach Justin Langer might have made ninety odd in that game, and and we lost it. Um, and I remember copping a fair spray from him actually after I hit the sign because we were carrying on, but we were <laughs> we were certainly well behind <laughs> behind the eight ball. And um, so no, it was uh, it was funny because I was out there with um, Nathan Adcock, who who I went to the cricket academy with, and um, we were really close mates. And um, I think he was more excited than I was initially. Um, and, he certainly uh, one looked of excited. Moments, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was a very excitable big fella. And um, anyway, and um, yeah, it was one of those moments you just go, oh, did that really happen? Um, and then, uh, as I said, you know, we were we were behind the eight ball, so I had to pretty quickly um, try and calm my emotions. And I think JL probably helped that um, by getting stuck into me. And, <laughs> um, um, but as I said, we didn't uh, didn't go on and win that but uh, that game. It was actually, I think, uh, a pretty ordinary game by us. So um, yeah, we, we enjoyed the the, the moment, um, albeit fleeting. And then uh, yeah, the result itself probably overshadowed um, that and, and probably highlighted where we were at at that stage, though. To be fair, as well. Yeah, now the second time you hit the sign, you, mm. you mentioned Rod Marsh and your involvement with him at the academy. For those mm. that don't know, uh, Rod Marsh's son was a, a very capable first-class cricketer as well, played down at Tasmania. And in 03 04, you're playing a day-night game at the Adelaide Oval against Tasmania and mm. you had to come in at the end and get some pretty quick runs to chase down a total. Talk us through hitting the sign for the second time. <laughs> Yeah, it was um, it was a miss hit actually. Um, this time it was uh, was square of the wicket, and um, those that are familiar with Adelaide Oval and the old Adelaide Oval, um, uh, one of the criticisms for batters batting on Adelaide Oval was that um, it was a batting paradise, and um, they were short boundary square. So um, I, th- I think it was a, a full toss. That um, I was trying to hit over the member stand, and as I said, it was um, yeah, it was a miss hit, and managed to hit the sign. And um, oh gosh, I can't remember who I was out there batting with, but um, again, we carried on like pork chops. Um, and ironically, that year we hit the sign three times as a team. Callum Ferguson um, hit it at Adelaide Oval, and. Um, Did Andy, Andy Flower? Flower yeah. hit it? Yeah, um, I, but I can't recall where he hit it. But um, I'll never forget, as you said, Rod Marsh. Um, he was uh, he was actually in charge of um, um, South Australian cricket at the time, um, or about to be in charge. Uh, he came down and 
and visited the change rooms and he said to me after the game, he said, oh, you know, I was up there. I didn't actually quite see what was going on, but I saw you carrying on like a pork chop and <laughs> I looked at the scoreboard and thought, what are they, what are these idiots? He, he, he used a couple of other profanities yeah. doing yeah. carrying on. They haven't won the game yet. Um, and then he realized what had happened. So um, it was one of the few times and the odd ways that he would congratulate you at times, Rod. So, yeah, different different set of circumstances. And um, it was at the time when, you know, the game was sort of transitioning domestically to, to playing a lot more day-night cricket. So, um, you know, early, as you're probably aware, through that period of time, um, the broadcasters were, were Channel 9 and that was it. And most of those were in and around, um, you know, international cricket um, the domestic matches that were televised. So when those games weren't being televised, we were, we were trying to play as many day-night games as, as we could. So um, it wasn't televised, but yeah, it lived in, in some people's memory. So, yeah. Yeah, well, certainly the 3,447 in attendance. If any of you are listening to the <laughs> podcast, please drop us a line because I'd, I'd love to hear what it was like uh, from someone firsthand at the ground as well. Now, 2004, Darren Lehman's the named captain of South Australia, yeah. but you're his, his deputy of sorts and, and you yeah. get your first taste of, of leadership of that group. Can you talk us through captaincy and um, your approach to it at the time and how it evolved uh, throughout your career? Um, yeah, oh, look, I mean, it was an, it was an absolute honour to, um, to, to captain your state. Um, at, and at that time, um, you know, coming through, I you know played at the same club as, as Darren, um, so I had a had a lot of experience playing with and under Darren. Um, so it was it was an easy easy thing to transition into in terms of um, the cohesion of the of the team. Um, a lot of my um, cricketing beliefs were, were formed by Darren and, and our club. Um, who had the likes of Glenn Bishop and and other um, uh, you know significant state cricketers that that passed through the club that that really shaped the way that I, I looked at the game. So and, and and at that time we had a real focus of trying to nurture young South Australian cricket cricketers, I should say, coming through the team. So there was a real sense of excitement um, around the, the South Australian cricket community. At, at the time, so as I said, it was one of um, immense um, pride and, and privilege. And I think what um, you know early on, you you try and do the right thing. You try and um, please as many people as you can. And and I think then over time, you learn um, perhaps to trust others. Um, you know whether that be um, a, a certain bowler to bowl at a certain time. Um, or, or you just trust in the fact that you don't need to say anything. The guys know exactly what their their roles and responsibilities are, and um, you know because you've set up the plans and, and processes well enough that um, that sometimes you it's a bit like parenthood. You've got to you got to let them go and see how they how they handle it. And I think that that was probably the biggest shift for me was was just being able to take a step back and. And be okay with with failure, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, um, so that was that was the biggest learning um, for me, uh, alongside the fact that um, yeah, it, it can be quite lonely at times. Um, you know, you, you, people ask a lot of you um, yeah. in in leadership roles, but um, quite often they don't ask about you. <laughs> Yeah. In terms of how you how you're going and, and whether you need a um, a chop out, but um, you know a lot of the times that's that's why you're given the roles because you can handle handle uh, those workloads. But they're probably the lessons that, that and the evolution that I that I took and certainly helped in terms of transitioning out of out of the game um, as well. Some of the skills that I learnt through that time. Yeah, absolutely. And on, on a, a slightly lighter note, I, I'm just going to play something here. This is um, this is a little clip from someone who played under your captaincy and then also was your captain. Uh, I'll mm. just I just want to get your response uh, to to these words from um, our uh, previous guest on the show, Maxi Klinger. Hold 
off and Graeme Manu was the captain at South Australia and George Bailey was batting so he asked me to come on and bowl an over and then you could see the crowds coming in and Bale was, was pretty scared I think just not to get out I bought him one half track of his before and the rest he just started he just patted back to me so. <laughs> um, and then literally as the over finished it started pouring rain and the, the game was over it was called a draw so um, I'm thankful to, to Graeme Manu for giving me that one over Thankful to Graham Manu for giving me that one over. The only over bowled by Michael Klinger in first class cricket. And since speaking to Michael, uh, Aidan Blizzard has actually confirmed that he agrees that Michael <laughs> Klinger is the worst bowler he, he he's seen in first class cricket. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, yeah, I'd have to agree that um, definitely the worst bowler I've ever seen as well. Um, what was I thinking? I honestly can't remember it. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, oh, the, look, the fact that um, uh, based on Michael's description, um, not a lot must have been happening. And I, I do recall through that period of time, the wickets in Tasmania were, um, weren't were that um, conducive to, to outright results. So, gosh, I can't remember the state of the game, but um, we must have been desperate or bored. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, speaking of Tasmania, I, I, I want to talk about um, a highlight for you, uh, your highest first-class score playing against Tasmania. Uh, unfortunately, you guys uh, don't win this particular game mm. thanks to RT Ponting coming yeah. out and, and getting runs in the fourth innings. Uh, a couple of talking points here. Uh, firstly... What's it like to be 99 not out overnight? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Um, especially when Ryan Harris was sitting on his back. Um, you know, I think I might have been you know, around about oh, 70 or close to 80 at the time. Um, and he refused to single. So um, as I was walking off the ground that night, Tana came up and he goes, geez, I bet you wish Rhino had taken that single now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, it's funny, isn't it? Um, you know, my wife who's um, uh, involved in athletics, she just she can't get her head around the fact that um, one run means so much when you've already scored 99. So um, I, I let the argument lie there. But, um, yeah, not great, not great going to bed on 99, not out. And then the next day you're involved in a 250-run partnership with a man who's made a test match double century, the very likeable Jason Gillespie, big fan of Jason Gillespie on this podcast. But did Jason Gillespie let you down? He, he, made, he made 118 not out in this game. You're eventually dismissed for 190 is there more he could have done to get you across the line for that double hundred? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I've described him as the greatest French cricketer I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, he he managed to with that technique to score a, a test double century, um, and he lets you know about that um, every time he sends you a text message. He signs off with his uh, with his 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 highest test score just to, to remind you every single time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he, um, I think, I think it was part boredom of watching him for, for so long, um, yep. just lock the hell out of them. Um, and, you know, we were trying to move the game forward. I think, um, you know, he certainly was towards the back end of his career. So he was probably thinking he didn't want to go out and bowl. Yep. Um, but I can't be too harsh on, on the big fella because, um, he actually nicked one behind on naught. Um, Did he? Yes. Uh, and Dizzy wasn't a walker, obviously. So um, it could have been a very different story, to be fair. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would – obviously scoring uh, or making your highest first-class score um, and one of, of, of sort of that significance is, um, is memorable. But to do it with someone like him who – um, you know, you, you've seen it in action. Him doing the uh, the dance when he scored his half century in Test cricket. That's that's dizzy all over. Um, and if you want someone out there to have a 
have a laugh and have some fun and, and not take not take things too seriously, then he's your man. But um, yep, I'm blaming him, and <laughs> I still don't think I was out though. I'm, I'm adamant that I wasn't out LBW to yeah. Michael Dighton of all people. Needed a bit I of think, DRS you know, in the shield. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I haven't let it go, have I? <laughs> no, I think we, we, we need to get some closure here. I think, yeah. I think too, just, just on Jason Gillespie there, I, I don't know many – I'd have to get the Cricket Library boffins onto this one, but for someone – I'm pretty sure that was Gillespie's first Sheffield Shield 100, and I don't think there'd be many people that had scored Test Match double hundreds before they'd scored Sheffield Shield centuries. So – if anyone can clear that one up for us, get in touch. That's a good stat, I reckon. Yeah, it is, yeah. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me, actually. I know he scored at least two for South Australia from memory. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting. But I think you'd probably be right there. Yeah, all right. Well, if you're out there listening and you know the answer to that, get in touch, please. Now, Baggy Green, number 411. Uh, the Ashes Tour, you're over there. Uh, Haddon's the the first choice keeper, uh, you would have, I, I'd imagine you'd be loving life uh, on tour with the Australians. How do you, how do you get the news that um, you might be a chance of putting the gloves on and wearing the baggy green? Yeah, it was um, a pretty bizarre set of circumstances. Um, uh, as you said, you know, being on an Ashes tour, um, yeah, every every Australian um, boyhood dream to to tour on an Ashes tour and um, you know hopefully play. But um, look, you know, I was there. I, I understood my role and um, day one, Edgbaston, um, uh, or the whole test actually was um, was rain interrupted. But day one in particular, and um, we got news that uh, just before um, the tea breaks, I think they brought it forward um, slightly. Um, that, that the day would go ahead and the test match would start. So um, we were out doing our normal routine and I think I'd just finished um, uh, helping Hads warm up. Um, at that time, he, he decided to go and um, just have a few ciders uh, of, of some of the quicks and I think he wanted to have a quick look at um, something for Mitch Johnson. And So he was doing his... Thing and I was helping a couple of the other lads. I think I'd um, just finished some um, short stuff with, with Shane Watson and turned my head and just at that moment I saw him sort of just stick his hand out. He was half interested, half not. Um, he was looking to head back to the, the dressing room. Anyway, saw him shake his hand and I didn't think much of it um, other than I thought, mate, get inside. You don't need to be <laughs> stuffing around here and Anyway, I went inside and there was a bit of commotion happening and guys were getting ready to pad up and uh, Steve Bernard came up to me and said, mate, you better just get your head around things. You might be playing. Wow. What do you mean? He said, um, yeah, it looks like um, Brad's broken his finger. We're just checking with um, uh, the England side and the match referee to see if we can um, uh, change the the team sheet because the toss had had taken place and, and we were batting. And um, literally, as uh, as Watto and um, Simon Caddick were walking out to to bat, um, I got the all clear that um, that the the English and match referee had agreed to change the team sheet. So um, I wonder whether um, you know, having um, played with Andy Flower, who was the England coach at the time, um, helped from a relationship point of view. But I think you know. Um, indebted to, to those guys in a sense that um, they showed uh, great sportsmanship to, to allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was um, it was uh, uh, one of mixed emotions, really, because you know you you work so hard to get to, to that point to be considered to go on a tour. Um, you know your place, and um, you know. Um, Brad and I um, have been pretty close mates across our careers, you know, the utmost respect for each other and to see him get injured in, in, on a tour that, like that that means so much to the Australian cricket team was was um, it was really deflating and then you um, you sort of, you, you're the beneficiary of that and, it, and it's really difficult, um, <laughs> yeah. really a difficult thing to, to take on and... Um, and then, ironically, uh, 
as the as the game was petering out in the second innings, um, you know, I, I actually broke my hand um, batting. So, wow. <laughs> um, so I sort of sit there and I think, oh, you know, what I was sort of in that one test category, which sometimes it's it's nice to have, and then other times you're a little bit embarrassed by it. But um, yeah, you, you you're kind of left wondering, well, what if? Um, but then having said that, you know, Brad um, was able to manage through. Um, you know, uh, being well looked after by the medicos to, to complete the rest of that test series, and um, yeah, you just never know. But um, yeah, just a, a, a wave of emotions that um, uh, yeah, a, a cricket game could give you. But uh, yeah, I'll never forget, and didn't get the baggy green till the second um, second day of the test match the oh, next wow. morning. So yeah, yeah. very bizarre. Yeah, and was that pre pre getting presented in front of the team? Was it was, was it ceremonious or was it a fairly quiet passing over of the cap? Yeah, no, we um, uh, as I said, we we batted first, so we um, we managed to uh, navigate that day pretty well. And um, next morning, um, our session and um, warm up was was conducted more so in the net. And prior to um, warming up. Um, yeah, it was um, it was great to have uh, Ricky Ponding presented, and um, I can't recall um, a lot of what he said. Um, but what I do recall through that period of time was uh, was how happy every single person in that group was for everybody when they succeeded, and then to experience something like that where they they had all experienced it and, and knew what it felt like, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, I'd never experienced um, such culture and cohesion in a in a in a group because you, you you then belong to this unique this unique group. But um, you know, it, it still takes some some wonderful people to continue that um, that culture. And yeah, geez, they made made you feel like you were part of it and that you weren't it and you deserve to be there, even despite the circumstances. Oh, that's magnificent. And you, you end up getting the chance to play some one-day internationals again uh, through someone else being injured. Uh, can can mm. you t- talk us through uh, y- your, your time playing for Australia in the in the coloured clothes? Yeah, same sort of circumstance. Um, um, Tim Payne um, uh, had the opportunity to to play in the one day side and um, I'd just come back from injury myself actually or from that hand injury and um, I uh, got the call um, from Jamie Cox at the time who was um, uh, one of the selectors and um, the head of high performance at South Australia and uh, he he rushed me to the airport I had to fly from Adelaide to Sydney to get a visa um, then from Sydney to, to Delhi Arrived the morning before the game, um, the next day. So it was a bit of a whirlwind, um, start, but, uh, I'll never forget that, that tour because we hadn't, um, we hadn't had a lot of success in, in the subcontinent and, um, it was, it was a, an amazing series win, um, considering the amount of injuries that the, the squad had had, um, some were being rested, um, and the quality of opposition, you know, they, the Indians uh, were playing some some magnificent cricket. Sandilka was still playing exceptionally well, um, so to come away with a series win was was magnificent. But um, one of the lasting memories I have in in a bit of the haze of uh, of jet lag and and playing a game of cricket in India um, the day after you arrived was um, in Delhi when we went out to uh, to field. We fielded second. Um, Tendulkar was was batting quite well, and Cameron White was at first slip, and um, I, I I couldn't hear him speak. Wow! Um, the noise was that loud, um, particularly when Tendulkar was was going, and um, and and when they were were sort of getting to the point where where they were going to win. And I, I I think they won that match. From memory, maybe I'm wrong, but um, yeah, I, I, that, my lasting memory of that was just the fact that I couldn't hear Cameron White talk, trying to talk to me at first. That it was that noisy. Wow! Now mm-hmm. y- you come back to Australia. 2020 cricket uh, is 
is on the horizon. You get to play in a couple of finals for South Australia in the pre-Big Bash kind of era. You, you lose one to Victoria and our, our previous guest on the show, Aidan Blizzard, spoiled the party in that yeah. one. Uh, and then the next year, Blizz comes across uh, to play with South Australia and you, you get to win a Big Bash title at South Australia. What, what are your recollections of, of that? Yeah, no doubt. I'm sure Blizz um, claimed it to be all him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we actually. Um, I, I recall. Um, I recall the fact that we were playing some terrific um, short form cricket um, through that period. We had had some guys in tremendous form and some real skill. Um, fortunately for us, at that period of time, we we moved out of. T20 just being this sort of gimmick, if you like, and then with the the champions, um, the champions mm. league event at the end of it, it was a it was a significant carrot for for the players. So um, very quickly, T20 turned um, to a very serious format. But um, I remember um, uh, across those couple of years, we had um, we had terrific skill and balance in our side. Um, and then adding the likes of uh, Shahid Freedy, um, uh, Pollard, uh, that was that was when he was was first making his mark um, uh, as a as an international sort of superstar in that format. And then throw um, Adil Rashid in there, a young yeah. Adil Rashid, who um, is probably one of the the more skillful leg spinners that I've had the pleasure to to keep with it too, and. Um, it was just a really exciting time, and um, you know we had uh, we had Mark Sorrell, a, a young coach, and and he was then well supported by Jeff Bourne and um, oh, yeah, and morning. then Darren Berry um, as well, who is probably in my time um, before it is what it is now um, was was up there as one of the the best prepared coaches I, I'd come across. Um, his his attention to detail was second to none, and and brought a, uh, a pretty sound um, strategy and philosophy to that that format, and was a big contributor to our success um, in in that period of time too. So, yeah, it was it was great fun, and um, it was the only title that I won for South Australia. And you know, on reflection, with some of the teams that we had, albeit you know, as you mentioned earlier. That time in domestic cricket was was relatively strong because the schedule allowed um, at different times, but um, the talent pool was was exceptional. Um, but uh, yeah, we we probably um, underachieved at times, South Australia. So to to win something um, was pretty special. Yeah, and you you get a, a spot at the Melbourne Renegades in the Big Bash. Uh, tell us about the the early days of the Big Bash, the fanfare. Uh, sort of past that gimmicky kind of stage. Mm. Um, Melbourne Renegades recollections. Yeah, I, um, I, I I'd retired actually and um, had no intention um, uh, of of playing in the Big Bash. Um, uh, I, I'd, I'd retired and got married and moved to Melbourne. Um, uh, uh. And, and was was actually up in Brisbane at the time, and I um, the Victorian side were were up there for a pre season, I think, um, around September October, and um, uh, Simon Helmet uh, was appointed as the Renegades coach, who was the Victorian assistant coach at the time, and I think he was head coach of their one day team through that period too, and. Uh, we bumped into each other, and um, and uh, he and Hodgie were 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 keen to um, get me in, involved, um, knowing that I was I'd moved to Melbourne more um, out of an interest to see whether I'd um, want to dip my toe into the the, the coaching world. And yeah, I thought, why not? Um, you know, I'd, I'd moved over there, and I was I'd, I wanted to play club cricket in Melbourne and had signed on for, for Richmond Cricket Club. Um, one, just to see how a different system operates, but then two, to, um, I guess, try and create a, another network of mates in, in Melbourne. So I was playing club cricket at the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, just 
as it as it got closer to the time, you know, I, I went in, went into the tournament um, physically underprepared, thinking that I was um, was just going to coach. And then um, the week before the tournament started, I remember we had a, a trial match. Would you believe on the NCG between the Renegades and the Stars? And they asked me to play, which I couldn't turn down. Um, yeah, you know, what an opportunity to be a part of um, the, the inaugural year and. Um, you know, I take my hat off to everyone involved in that year because um, it, it it changed the landscape for domestic cricketers, um, and then probably changed again, didn't it? When uh, when it went to free to wear, because um, for the first time since my childhood, when I recall watching the Sheffield Shield on Channel Nine on a Saturday morning um, um, in Adelaide, you know, domestic cricketers were relevant again. Yeah, to the public, um, they became recognisable, and um, yeah, you know, I think it's been a, a, a terrific thing um, for our sport. Um, the injection of life that's given, and the flow-on effect that is provided to the other formats um, has been been wonderful. You know, I think uh, a lot of the doomsdays, even in those early parts of, um, of the BBL, were, were fearful of what it might do to the other formats, but. I think it's actually made them more exciting and engaging um, in which uh, the, the, spe- the speed of the game now um, is phenomenal and I have no doubt that um, T20 has is, is, um, is, is played a massive part in that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just the, the, as you say, that connection to domestic cricket uh, is something I grew up with. I remember watching, as we mentioned earlier, the Mercantile Mutual mm-hmm. Cup, the ING Cup, that's what you'd watch on a Sunday at home. And uh, for the Big Bash to come in and essentially be on most nights of the week during the school holidays, yeah. uh, as a dad myself now with kids that love watching cricket, it's it's magnificent. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's great to have that connection point and now just yeah. j- just on family um mm. what you, you transition out of cricket you, you sort of sounds like you started to transition out and then you, you you came back in and had that year with the renegades uh for those that don't know so, some people may not mm. be aware your wife as well an elite level athlete uh tamsin lewis she's won some gold medals at the commonwealth games and world indoor championships uh how how did you manage uh life, um, uh, work-life balance, all that sort of stuff, um, and, and try and get the best out of yourselves with your careers? Yeah, it was um, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, it was for, the, for the first five years of our relationship, we, we lived in separate states. Um, um, we, uh, we would try and see each other as, as often as we could, but... Um, um, I think the fact that we both had um, the understanding of, of what we were trying to do and achieve, and um, you know, they, they were both very understanding of, of what it means when you have a good day and what it means when you don't have a, a good day. So, um, to have someone there that you could talk, um, you know, things through all the time was was terrific, and you know, I credit her um, more than anyone for. For the turnaround in, in my cricket, um, you know, she taught me a different way to prepare and and perhaps be be more of a professional um, mm. outside of, of what a cricket person normally would be at that time. So, um, yeah, it was it was a, it was challenging early on, but um, it, it was really clear for me um, at the back end when uh, when I was considering um, the next step. You know, I, no doubt. Um, I could have kept playing physically. Um, I, I think I, I could have played um, another year or two um, emotionally and mentally. But um, the the driving force has always been to try and get the best out of yourself and to play at the highest level. And you know, at that time, the the discussion for me was that um, you know Haddon was was certainly entrenched, and um, they were then looking to go. To the to the next level, which was the younger player. So, yeah. Um, the message for me was is probably past you now. Um, you had your opportunity. It didn't didn't work as um, the way you'd hoped. So, for me, it was really easy decision to go. You know what? Um, I've, I've I've been lucky. Um, I don't want to hang on longer than I I, I need to. Um, there's other things in life that I want to achieve, and and 
and simply when um, uh, when I came out the other side, knowing that I'd, I'd want to have a family, and I, I've as I alluded to, I had um, I had uncles that had, that had also played sport um, through through my uh, early age ages and through my teens, and I got a got an insight into what it could look like if things didn't go wrong and you put everything in the one basket. So um, it was it was a really clear and easy decision for me to just go, you know what, um, uh, Tamsin's got the opportunity to continue her journey. I'll, I'll support her and, and make the move to Melbourne and, and, and start life after cricket because um, you're a long time retired and there, there's a lot of opportunity out there. So... Yeah, it was um, it was an easy decision, and I remember where I made it. Ironically, going back to <laughs> going back to Tasmania, I was walking up the same hotel that we stayed in for years, and I just thought to myself, "What am I doing?" Wow. So, yeah, it was it was a simple decision for me. Yeah, so you, you're one of those people that it rings true. You just when, when you know, you know that it's it's time to finish. Yeah, yeah, and as I said, I it, it, I wasn't fearful. Um, I had a few people actually question um, the speed in which I was wanting to transition, and that was probably some some sound advice that I um, took on board. Um, yep. You know, I, I, I've spoken to Darren Lehman actually um, about his experience because um, he went and tried a couple of things, and uh, a very close uh, friend and mentor of mine suggested the same. Um, you know, just just go and have a crack at a couple of things that um, you you probably deep down know that you're not suited to, but um, just to make sure that you you think you're on the right track. And and again, I was pretty fortunate coming out that um, uh, I I'd, I'd created a pretty good network through my playing days, and um, I was offered offered a role um, at Bramble um, and well Bramble Shep um, in Melbourne, so. Um, there was an opportunity to go um, straight from from a, you know, a full time professional um, playing career into into um, uh, another job opportunity. So I wasn't sort of sitting around wondering what I'm going to do. Um, but that I took that opportunity knowing that it wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, yeah. Um, but I thought you know that you you can still learn from things that um, all those sorts of experiences. So. And I did, and I did. So um, I'm grateful for for that. And as I said, mate, it was uh, a pretty simple decision for me. And life now for the Manu family. What what's life mm. looking like now? <laughs> Crazy. Um, <laughs> sounds sounds like my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've um, yeah we've uh, we've got two children now. Um, our eldest is uh, in in prep. So, um, you know, like like a lot of parents, um, trying to juggle um, doing some work um, uh, and homeschooling. Um, um, my wife and I are failing prep Chinese, but our daughter seems to be flourishing. Um, oh, we're learning Chinese at my house as well, uh, believe yeah. it or not. There you go. We'll have to exchange <laughs> notes off air later. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we've got a, a young young fella. He's, uh, he's two and a half and... Um, yeah, he's he's uh, a little giant, um, full of energy, and trying to keep him under control um, again during this time is, is a challenge. But um, yeah, they're they're full of beans and love being active, and um, yeah, they're they're taking up all our time and energy, which is the way it should be. And um, yeah, we've uh, we've spent the last two years up in Brisbane. Um, um, my role at Cricket Australia took, took me there for a period of time, and um, uh, you know, family sort of um, calls and um, with our daughter one, uh, about to start school, we, we we transitioned back to Melbourne, so we've we've settled back in Melbourne the last sort of three or four months, and ironically, the timing couldn't have been better um, given the the situation in the world. To be close to the family and support networks has, has been been beneficial but um yeah Tanzan's um uh full on with with her athletic commitments um yep. school commitments that um she's involved with uh, teaching some of the young girls uh, at Burbank Grammar um 
you know, Peter Russo, the former Hawthorne um, Premiership player, heads up uh, heads up the uh, the physical education department out at Fairbank Grammar, and has had her there for about five or six years now. So, and she loves um, loves looking after the young girls coming through, and, and is, you know is closely aligned to um, to world athletics and commentary and all these sorts of things. So it's a, it's a busy household, um, and uh, it's been nice to be home for a period of time in one place to to uh, just enjoy each other's company for a change, which has been good. Yeah, absolutely. And it has been a, a wonderful conversation, Graham, and I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm sure our listeners will as well. But before we let you go, uh, mm. this is our favourite question, the one that, people are always dying to hear the answer to. If you, if you could invite three people to the Nets, now they don't have to be cricketers. Uh, they, could, ah, okay. they, yeah. they could be cricketers. Um, yeah. uh, just as an example, uh, we've had uh, Dean Jones has got a run. Huss has had a couple of runs. Um, yeah. Johnny Howard got a, got a <laughs> ticket to the Nets thanks to <laughs> Peter George. That was, I thought that was a good pick. <laughs> Uh, and then um, I think Horry had um, Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne the Rock Johnson um, from oh, yeah. professional yeah. wrestling circles. I'd, I'd probably go with a Hulk Hogan if I was going a wrestler. But up to you now, yeah, Graham yeah. Manu, uh, three people for the Nets. Uh, who, who, who do you pick? Oh, God. Well, uh, a, a cricket thing for me would be um, uh, Warren Murley. And Bradman, I just would love to see how Bradman would cope on wow. a turning wicket to those guys. That would be v- and, and, and that would, would you... be my cricket nuffy um, net session if I could have it. Would you be behind the stumps chirping Bradman by chance? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you can't be that good and um, not to have a cheeky wicketkeeper behind giving it to him. So, yeah. I, I mean, if I was to, to choose a pure cricket thing, I think that would be um, that oh. would be something that I'd love to see. Because um, be I don't think he played a lot in subcontinent um, conditions. Mm. Um, and I'd love to see how we cope because it's something that we're we're learning to deal with as a as a nation in terms of developing players against spin. So it's a bit of deep down. I am a a, a closet cricket nuffy. So that would be my three um, pure cricket um, net session. I'd say ninety nine point nine four percent of our listeners would be in the pure <laughs> cricket nuffy uh, category there, Grave. So, yeah. so you, you've pleased the masses on this occasion. Thanks so much yeah. for joining us. It's been a real thrill. Uh, wish you all the best with the family. Uh, keep soaking up that family time while you can at the moment, and um, yeah, hope all goes well for for life in the future for yourself and the family. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. A massive thanks to Graham Manu for joining us on this edition of the Cricket Library podcast. A very enjoyable conversation and a very enjoyable net session. Imagine that, being behind the stumps, keeping wickets to Bradman at the crease with SK Warren and Mutai Muralitha and sending them down in the nets. That would be a net session to remember, that's for sure. And if you enjoyed today, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And if you want to hear more, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Go back, check the back catalogue. Aidan Blizzard's there, Michael Klinger, Kristen Beams, Leah Poulton, Tim Ludeman, Nathan Horitz, Peter George, Daryl Tuffy, Graham Winter. Take your pick. There's plenty to choose from. And we look forward to your company again next time as we talk about the stories that have inspired a love of cricket. And this has been Matt Ellis for the Cricket Library podcast. Look forward to your company next time. Bye for now.